Um, but really, we have, uh, we started out with two employees 17 years ago, and today we have 250 employees, and, and really, as so many of you know in the dairy industry, it's about making good choices on the farm with the cows that matter, and so it, it's so much of our business is, is, our success is based off of those people. It's not really off of anything that I do or John or Todd, it's about our people. Uh, I, one of the, uh, one of the questions I get frequently is why has the farms gotten so big? And uh, I can say with all sincerity that when my grandfather was uh, 19 years old, there was 140,000 dairy farmers in Wisconsin. And before the first large farm showed up in Wisconsin about 20 years ago, we were down to, to about 18,000. So we had lost 122,000 farmers before the real large farms started coming onto the scene. Um, and today there's 12,000. And in, in 10 years there'll be even less. And so what larger farms have done is we filled in uh, the need, the demand. Right now, Wisconsin's importing about 7% of their uh, milk product into the cheese vats. So there's still a demand for more milk here in Wisconsin than we have. But this is where we started. But we started in John's dad's farm in a red barn right here. And we had 180 cows in a, in a fr little freestyle barn attached. And over time, we grew. We built a 600-cow dairy, and, and then we added added to the ends and, and now we have basically a thousand cows in each barn and a, a thousand dry cows out back. Um, but typical of large farms in Wisconsin, we have a feed area where we have drivable feed piles. Uh, we have uh, watertight earthen storages for our manure and we apply that to the local land. Uh, we started here in Kakana, Wisconsin. Uh, 6,800 total cows, about 67 employees and we average about 88 pounds a cow. Uh, that's a kind of a 12-month average. Some, some as, as many of you know in the industry, sometimes it's better production and sometimes it's a little bit lower. Uh, we, we own about uh, 1,300 acres and we're trying to add more acres with the uh, ethanol boom and commodity boom of corn prices. We're very concerned about the cost of feed, so we're trying to add acres. Uh, we contract and we, we farm a bunch of land in that area and we contract a bunch of land with local growers. Uh, about 12 years ago, we bought a farm that had gone, uh, it had failed three times. And uh, a couple more financial failures and one was a managerial failure. And everybody said, do not buy that farm, there's a ghost. And uh, it turns out, well, we were uh, foolish enough to buy it, but it turned out uh, to be a very good decision for us. It was uh, 600 cows at Amro Dairy and we expanded it to about 2,700. I don't think you'll see us adding any cows there because the community's right here. And so all of our land base is off on one direction, so it's not in the best location uh, for expansion. So that, that farm is, uh, by the way, last year was our highest producing herd. We did just over 90 pounds last year. Uh, Long-term average is 84 pounds. Uh, cows are down a bit this year. Um, and uh, we have a double 38 parlor. We've, we contract all of our crops there. We, we own some ground, but we rent it to our grower and our grower contracts back with us. And then uh, some may know that we've started a dairy uh, called Newchester Dairy, which is north of the Wisconsin Dells, about a half hour, 40 minutes. And that dairy is under construction and we're pouring concrete as we speak. Uh, the, the feed area, uh, the building right now, this is a facility for 4,400 cows. And then we have some manure storages. We have a very elaborate manure processing facility right here and then manure, dry manure storage is right there and that's in central Wisconsin. That farm will consist of an 80 cow uh, rotary parlor and we would like to milk cows sometime next spring and uh, our, our business model is milk cows three times a day and uh, really focus on cow comfort which is why we bed with sand and, uh, and focus on taking having well-trained people taking care of cows that's our, our our sole motive. Um, so many people think, well, because they're big, they don't focus on cows. And I would say, if you pulled a hundred dairymen that knew us, they would say, we know cows. And I, we really focus on cow comfort and cow health. And that's uh, a secret to our success. Uh, about 10 years ago, we started a farm called Calf Source. And Calf Source was a, a farm that raised baby calves to 180 days of age. And about seven years ago, we sold it sold to Smithfield Foods, 
And they sold it a few years later to JBS, which is, uh, to give you an idea how large they are, they have a, a million head of cattle in the United States. Uh, so calf source didn't uh, really fit their vision, and so we just purchased it back. And uh, we have uh, 4,500 hutches and uh, six row barns, or excuse me, three sided barns facing south. Um, if there's anybody here that knows how to, who knows how to feed calves? Nobody, okay, well, there's a couple days in December we're gonna need some help. <laughs> Hutches are wonderful for calves, and as many of us know, they're really hard on people in the worst weather. And so we do a lot of things for the employee to abate the weather, but we need to, uh, that's the challenge with having a great facility for calves and a hard one on people. So we spend a lot of energy trying to make it a little bit better for people. Calves are doing extremely well there uh, since we purchased it back, and uh, the performance of the calves is just stunning. It's, uh, uh, it's all, uh, what we've learned about calves is um, feed them aggressively and clean, clean, clean your equipment and your pails and, and everything that touches the calf. Get the bacteria out of the way and the calves do well. And so that's, that's the lessons that we've learned. 9,200 calves there, they leave there at about uh, 170 days of age. 31 employees uh, and uh, after, at, let me back up and just give you a, a better view. After uh, six weeks, six to eight weeks in the hutches, they go to three-sided pack barns, and then they go to freestall barns. And the freestall barns is just basically to transition them for later in life. And uh, if the calves are doing great in hutches, and the calves do great in freestall barns, when we get them on that pack and, and co-mingle them for the first time is where we see some challenges from time to time. And then we have Rosendale Dairy, which is the, the reason why we're uh, here today. And Rosendale was a soybean field 36 months ago, I believe, if I'm right on my schedule. And today uh, we have, uh, excuse me, we have 8,400 cows. And to give you a, a bit of a view, there's uh, 4,200 cows here and 4,200 cows here. And two rotary parlors, they're D-Laval parlors running right here in the middle. Uh, this is holding area, and this is a very elaborate uh, manure processing facility. We stack dry manure back here in recycled sand, and then we have manure storages here and here. And then we have our feed area and a commodity shed. We built a cross-ventilated facility. So traditionally, we have freestall barns with air circulating with fans on, on Rosendale, we have forced air, uh, and we have a cooling cell that, that cools the air here on a hot day, and the air blows across to the middle at about six miles an hour. Um, on the hottest day of the year, the cows at our, our other farms might be down 10 pounds on those real hot, miserable days. Here, they'll be half of that. It's just kind of the, the standard rule. It's just a more comfortable environment for cows. It's uncanny how much more comfortable it is on those really hot days. Uh, we have the 85 pounds a cow, uh, we milk 3x, uh, we, we own 2,700 acres, we farm uh, only 800. So a lot of that land that we own, we lease back to our growers. And then our growers will sell back to us uh, on a contract basis. And then we will also contract back our nutrients, our manure. And so we actually charge for the nutrients um, and the grower gets the nutrients at a discount, but we get some of the subsidy, some of the money to subsidize the cost of moving the nutrients. We direct fill our milk. So milk is automatically chilled out, uh, chilled down about 36 degrees, and uh, it directly gets loaded into the tankers and the cheese company. This gets hauled by an independent trucker to the cheese company, and the cheese company washes the tankers and, we send them, and sends them back to us. We put in a fairly uh, comfortable viewing room uh, for, for visitors, but I can say that I completely underestimated how that should have been built. I didn't know that people would be very interested in this farm, and so we built it more of a, a place for cows and for people, uh, for workers, but not for visitors. And if I did something diff would do something different about the farm, I would have made it quite a bit larger. Uh, this week alone, there's eight, eight or 900 people visiting the farm. Uh, we had 9,000 people for breakfast on the farm in June. They were absolutely overwhelmed. Uh, <laughs> the biggest that we'd seen on breakfast of the farm in the county was three or 4,000, and it just everybody came out to see Rosendale Dairy. Uh, people from around the world have been to see it. Uh, one day, 
unannounced, a, uh, a, a very high up official from China uh, came to the farm. Uh, and we didn't know he was a high up official in China, and I wasn't there. Uh, but my operations manager started asking him questions. Well, you know, what's it like to work in a communist country? Well, my guy, was, my, my guy shouldn't have been asking that question to a communist, but he... <laughs> but, so the, the, the official was asking um, my manager, well, what was it like to get permitted? How many people have heard about the Rosendale Dairy permitting process? It took us years to get the permits. Finally, the, the gentleman from China looked at my, my manager and said, well, my, my, uh, my manager said, well, what's it like to work in a, or live in a communist country? And he said, well, it would take us two days to get a permit to build a farm like this. Which country is more communist? <laughs> <laughs> but we do have a lot of visitors from around the world. And, you know, that, at the moment, Rosendale Dairy is one of those farms everybody in the industry wants to see. Next year, it'll be somebody else's new farm. And we've learned so much about how we do things from other people. That's why we're willing to have so many people and, and talk to people, is because we don't, I don't think we have very many original ideas. We've learned so much from fellow dairymen. Milk on an 80 stall rotary. Uh, I, quite frankly, consider myself a late adopter. Uh, rotary parlors have been in Wisconsin for 20, 30 years. Uh, rotary parlors have been used by large commercial dairymen in the United States for at least 15 years, and we just put our first ones in here. Uh, there's a couple reasons for that, and one is you can't expand a rotary once you have it, and we've always been kind of growing in little pieces. And two is I was afraid. I was afraid of mechanical problems. I was afraid of cow problems. And as it turns out, at least for the moment, the mechanical problems were an unfounded fear. And the cow problems are quite the opposite. If you watch cows go into a traditional parlor, they dance and they bump around a little bit. The cows in this parlor, it is absolutely uncanny. They fight to get on there. They love riding. And if we didn't bop them in the head with a 100-pound rubber mat, they would be riding it again and again and again. <laughs> they, 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 they get on here, they nudge each other, and they ride around. And this is a, it's a cow mat is what we hang up there. And they know when they get there, they have to leave. Otherwise, they just keep on going. Uh, it's about an eight-minute ride. And uh, the, the milkers are attached right in here somewhere. And uh, they're detached as they come around. Actually, I'm wrong about that. I'm on the wrong side of the barn. We have two parlors side by side. Attached, uh, wiped, uh, dipped in and, and wiped here and attached. And their units, you can see the units are starting to come off right here. So if in this picture, in the scheme of things, there's another parlor right here. An 80 stall rotary. There, you can get a view of both of them. It takes a, lo a lot of folks, and we thought this, would, we would save labor by building it. I don't know that we've saved labor. Um, but what we have done is improve quality. So, you know, in a batch system on a parlor, a, a traditional parlor, people are moving around. Here, the cows come to the person. So if you want a, a teat dip, uh, basically soak time or a, a teat dip on time for 12 seconds or 13 seconds or whatever the number is, uh, you can place a guy 13 seconds in the sequence so you get a little bit of more consistent quality. Two 80 stalls, we can at peak milk about a thousand cows an hour between them and each cow gets milked three times a day so it, uh, it run, they run pretty fast. Uh, all, everything's all clean in place. We shut down and clean up twice a day. This is the milk room. Uh, so the milk is piped in, run, runs through the chiller, and then directly into the, uh, the tankers. This is utility room. Everything is, uh, you would think with two parlors you could have, you could share backup equipment. We don't. Each side has its own backup system. There's a lot of redundancy. Uh, we have backup generators for the farm, uh, and that primarily because of the ventilation system, um, but also because the farm's got to run 24 hours a day. Everything, we try to keep everything, if you've ever been to the farm or you ever stop at the farm, you'll see we try to keep everything as clean as possible. We built these cross-ventilated barns, and each one is 400 feet by 1,250 feet. And we have that five, and a half, five to six mile an hour breeze running through it in the summer, in fall and spring at all times. And in the summer, it's up to 15 degrees cooler. Uh, we run water through a cooling cell on the side. 
And if it's dry outside and it's not real humid, we can drop the temperature 15 degrees. If it's real humid, we can drop the temperature 4 or 5 degrees. And we have about 300 cows per pen. And I, I realize that I'm saying some things that many of you know, um, but we, we try to manage the farm in 300 cow groups and we try to keep them in their groups. Uh, cows, as so many of us know, are very social animals. It, we've all heard the term boss cow. Uh, there's a boss cow in every pen, and there's a second in charge, and a third in charge, and a fourth in charge, etc. So we don't want to mix cows up very often. We don't, we don't want them to have to resort. We want a calm little community of cows, and, and so we focus on those groups. That's a side view of the facility. And that's that big uh, cooling cell. And what that is is, is basically a corrugated swamp cooler. Uh, you see them in different applications. They used to cool potato buildings with them and, and refrigerated before refrigeration, they cool a lot of things with, with swamp coolers. Every cow that we own is on sand bedding. Uh, we love sand and sand hates us. It gets in all the equipment. It gets it ruined stuff, but it sure cows absolutely love it. And they are comfortable with it. Uh, it gives them extra footing. Uh, abrasion for footing and our challenge is to get the sand back out of the manure. Rosendale Dairy has uh, a, a very large amount of space for cows. Uh, it, we, it's literally double the concrete of our other farms and of most farms. It's just we, we, we are opening up concrete space for cows. We have headlock, a headlock for every cow so the guys can work with them effectively. Our goal is to get in, when the cows come back from milking, they come up and eat, lock them up, do what you need to do, and 25, 30 minutes later, you're letting them go, and they can eat and, and sleep and roam around at their leisure. Uh, we have two or three of these large mixers, uh, and we're running 12 hours a day feeding cows. And uh, I would say one of our biggest focuses is on transition. Am I in your way? I'm looking. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, uh, the trans transitioning cows, whether it's pre-fresh, dry cows or just fresh. If, if we, what we've learned is if we do those three or four things right, the cow will reward us with good production and good health the rest of the way. And there's so many things in that step that, that's real important. We understock pens in this area. So there's way more space than, than you would think a cow should need and we just give them all kinds of, we want calm, we, we want to have all kinds of space and we want them to be able to move around at their leisure. We just want a very comfortable environment. Uh, the rations are handled the same way. Uh, we have a very, very large maternity area. Sometimes I grumble about how large it is because there's usually never anything in there. But then they re-bed everything for each cow each time. So this is just a little bedding pack they made for the cow for calving. Uh, we used to move cows in five, ten days ahead of time. And it seemed like we had a lot of calving problems. And now, rather than move her and upset her again, we wait until she's ready to have the baby, and then we move her in from the pen next door. And we're finding that to be substantially better for the cow and the baby. And uh, it's just a lower stress um, environment for the expecting mother. This is a, a heifer pen waiting to have babies. And that's typical calving. Uh, between all the farms, we'll have 60 babies a day on a typical day. Um, as many of you know, when there's a weather event coming through, a lot of cows will have babies all at once, and so some days it's obviously triple or quadruple that. And this is a typical day's worth of calves on this farm. The ones with the chains are, are males, and the ones with the ear tags are females. Calf source will pick them up uh, probably by the end of the day here and, and take them to calf source. And the whole crew at Calf Source spends uh, about 45 minutes with just those babies, getting them the right amount of feed, making sure they're all transitioned properly. They do get a gallon of colostrum here. And it's the, all the colostrum is, is measured and graded um, and checked for quality. We freeze it, and then we'll thaw it and use it for the calf. Does anybody recognize this guy? Larry the Cable Guy, uh, I, I've never hung out with Larry the Cable Guy, but I've got guys that work for us that think this is bigger than the Super Bowl. So <laughs> they are just crazy because Larry the Cable Guy came and did some filming, and he's gonna, we're going to be on, I think it's on the Discovery Channel uh, this fall. Is it on History Channel? Yeah. 
So anyway, there's people just ready to have a, a Larry the Cable Guy viewing party. So, <laughs> but he was there doing it only in America or something like that, and it was kind of exciting to have him at the farm. Typical of a fresh pen is to have very low density, uh, very low stress environment, real quiet. We're trying to implement a, a quiet farm. Uh, when I was a kid, I, I worked for one of the best dairymen in the state of Wisconsin, um, if not the nation at the time, and, and still is a, just a tremendous dairyman. And um, we'd, we'd go out to the barn and crank up the stereo and, and kick the cows up and try to get them to eat more. And we thought that was driving milk production. And what we've learned over the last two decades is that quiet and calm is good for a cow. She's, there's no histamine reaction, no stress reaction in her body and she's doing what she wants, and if, if, if she's comfortable, she's going to eat enough, and she's going to milk enough. Um, but if she's under stress, we're going to have all kinds of metabolic problems, we're going to have all kinds of calving problems, we're going to have feet and leg problems. So we want to really reduce stress, and so that's what we try to do. On every farm, we're trying to get steers. Uh, we, will, we feed our waybacks, our extra feed to our high groups, to our low groups. Um, in, and we also have leftover feed, and we feed that to some steers. So on Rosendale, we'd like to have six, 700 steers uh, just feeding up some feed. And with the steer market today, it's actually a good business. This is the ventilation system. So that's corrugated material. And on a real hot, dry day, we have water running full speed here. And then the air flows through this, uh, this, this way, and it cools that air. <coughs> and uh, the evaporation effect cools the air, and then it drops the temperature inside. On a really humid day, again, it's adding moisture to your environment and dropping it a little bit, but on those hot, dry days, it's just wonderful. We are putting this in on our next farm. Um, I have a rule, and that is, is I, most of us dairymen have a hard time admitting we make mistakes at least for three years, right? It was a great decision at first, and uh, by the third year, you're willing to admit it wasn't a great decision. Um, and so. I think we're at the point where we say this is a good decision. We think it, it works. Um, but I, I can't give it a full endorsement because we haven't run it long enough, but it seems like it's working real well. And that's what the material, that corrugated material, looks up real close. A couple downsides to it is we have to keep algae from growing on it, and we have to keep dust and, and debris from landing on it, and we have to clean it occasionally. And that's the fan side, so all that air comes across the barn in this direction. The fan guys like to sell to us. They think it's cool. Well, let's talk about manure. Um, it is a really big challenge for us. It's got a lot of value. Fertilizer costs are through the roof. You know, we buy chemical fertilizer also, uh, and we buy that from faraway places like Florida. Well, it makes a lot of sense to utilize the value of manure. And it's got an economic value to us, but we are uh, challenged by the fact that, A, we got a lot of sand in it because we love our cows, uh, but uh, that we got to get that sand back out. And B is we'd like to get maybe some of the water out long term would be nice, make it more economical to, to truck it. On this farm, we have a auger, and that auger runs all the way to a manure facility. And uh, it's a McClanahan auger. On our next farm, uh, it's just a design difference. We're putting in a flume. I'm, don't know which one's better, um, but the auger works very, very well. And that's close up of underneath the grate, there's an auger. And this is our manure facility. Now at Tidy View Dairy and Omro Dairy, we have low-tech manure. Uh, low-tech manure is manure drops into a uh, tank, we pump it to the lagoon. Every fall we mine that sand that settles out in that lagoon out in spreader after spreader after spreader. Um, here, we have high-tech. We spent a pile of money up front to get that sand back out and reuse it. Low-tech is cheaper. So me, the business guy, says, well, why are we doing something? Why are we spending a whole bunch of money so we have a higher cost of production? That's just silly. And the answer is, as well, because mining out the sand and hauling it through the neighborhood, 5,000 spreaders at a time, is very disruptive to, your, to our neighbors. And we're trying to find a better way. And we're willing to invest to find a better way. And we think that the, the mechanical sand separation, which we have mechanical, uh, McClanahan's sand separators right in here, um, is a way of reducing our impact to our neighbors. That is a very high priority for us. 
Now, we don't have everything all figured out, and there's a whole bunch of dairymen around the United States that are doing things like this or permutations of this, and we're all learning collectively. And uh, we, some of the concepts that we have here we've gotten from other people. Some of it has been from trial and error. What we do is we separate out uh, sand, and then we drop it into a tank, the liquid. We have a hydrocyclone that cleans up the effluent a little bit more. Uh, sand drops behind the wall. Uh, then it goes to fan separators up here, or uh, solid fiber separators. That drops here. The effluent from there goes to dissolved air flotation devices, which is a terrible picture, but it's actually a big tank back here. We got three of those. And we inject a polymer and some air bubbles, and we try to float out the remaining suspended solids. Uh, and after that, the cake that comes off of there goes through a horizontal centrifuge, which uses a whole pile of electricity and we wring out some water out of that. And then we end up with this cake product and we end up with the solid, uh, the liquid portion. Uh, all that uses electricity. So while, while we are doing some really good things for um, ways of improving manure to make it more marketable, it, it has a cost. This is where the manure drops in to the uh, uh, separation basin and we auger it up with McClanahan augers into the sand separators. A little bit different view. And that's sand cl getting cleaned as we go up. And uh, somewhere in here there's some water sprayers that spray water on it to wash it out a little bit more. Sand's dropping off here. You can see the sand pile. And this, this whole facility that costs a pile of money to build also <coughs> takes people to keep it operating, and there's a lot of moving parts in here. There's the solid separators. That takes out about half of the, dry, uh, the suspended solids in manure. So manure is, let's just say for easy math, 10% solids. That takes out about half of it. And those are the dissolved air flotation um, recovery systems, and we put in a very low-grade polymer into there uh, just to help flocculate it out. And then that's some effluent. Here's sand. This is stacked up sand. And what we've learned is we need to stack it up and leave it. Um, I have some colleagues that stack it up and move it up to five times. And that helps clean it up. It helps the water drain out of it and puts it in much better condition for uh, putting back by cattle. For a while there, we were washing it and putting it back under the cows in a couple days. That's not working for us. I have some friends that, that do it just fine, but it's not working for us. So we want to store it for as long as possible, but up to 60 to 90 days would be ideal. If you, if you come to the farm, you'll find everything to be very well mowed and manicured. Uh, we have asphalt around everything. I used to resist the notion of asphalt, thought it was a vanity um, unnecessarily. Um, I disagree with it now. I've changed my mind on it. It, is, it makes the farm run substantially better when you don't have mud dragging around and you don't have things mixing with the gravel and you're not replacing the gravel or grooming the gravel and you can clean up properly and expect your employees to clean up properly. So I really am a strong proponent of asphalt and uh, it, our farms are just running better because we have it there. This is a storage lagoon. This is for the liquid portion. Uh, we are putting in a underground pipeline system that's approved through DNR. And it is for piping under, uh, liquid underground uh, several miles throughout the neighborhood to take truckloads off the road. Uh, you know, large farms, as many of us know, get criticized for a lot of things. Uh, but there are two that I think are true. And most of them aren't. But the two that are true are uh, the odor and trucks. We have a lot of trucks. And anything that we can do to help minimize that impact on our community, we're working our butts off on. We're looking at, for the older side, we're looking at lagoon covers, and for the trucking side, we're looking at underground pipes. And we're also looking at this technology to pull some liquid out. We have uh, thousands of acres of alfalfa. We either grow it ourselves or we contract with a lot of growers. Uh, we're blessed with some really terrific farmers in our areas, and uh, we are able to contract a lot of feed, a lot of alfalfa, a lot of, obviously a lot of corn silage. Uh, at this moment in Kakana, that's at Tidy View Dairy, we're, f we're chopping right now with eight choppers, eight cloth choppers. 
that's 10 to 12 pack tractors, uh, and including in that number is a couple dozers, uh, D7s and 8s, uh, on the pack pile, and somewhere between 25 and 40 trucks, depending on the distance. Uh, unfortunately, we got a lot of rain, so we're using dump carts besides, so that slows us down a bit. Uh, here's a, a funny story is we, were, we weigh everything on the farm. So anything coming off the field, we weigh on the farm. And we have, um, at Tidyview, we don't have an on-demand generator um, because we don't have an elaborate ventilation system, so we didn't invest in an on-demand generator. But one thing about harvest is if your scale goes down, your whole enterprise goes down. And a couple years ago, our, scale went, our power went down, the scale went down, and we had 40 trucks backed up so bad that we couldn't even back up to the generator to turn it on because we had gridlock. So when the trucks are coming in every 35 to 50 seconds, uh, you've got to have, it, have everything working right. We don't chop any of this ourselves. Uh, there's so many small businesses in our area that grew up with us. So that, uh, we started getting larger in farming. We asked the neighbor if they'd be interested in doing some chopping for us because they had some good equipment. And they grew with us. We, don't, we try to stay focused. And they have uh, two different companies, two different family farms, have between them eight choppers. And, all these and other farmers in the area have trucks, so they all kind of uh, work contracts with us. That's a typical chopping with a dump cart. And on the farm at any moment, there'll be, a, at this time of year, trucks coming in. And that's obviously a haylage pile uh, being packed. Uh, we won't chop with eight choppers on haylage at one farm. It'll probably be more like six. There is one substantial inefficiency we have. Everybody asks me, what about economies of scale? What are you getting out of that? Well, we do get some economies of scale as the larger you get. One diseconomy of scale is the size of that feed area. So every, you know, all those truckloads that come in a feed, they all have to go to that feed center, that, that barn where, where we mix the feed. Um, one payloader bucket at a time. So it seems kind of crazy, but that's the, way we, that's the only way we have. So the more concrete you have, the more distance they have to travel with that. All of our feed piles are drivable, and we, t we stopped building bunker walls several years ago. Um, we think that with, with the two-layer plastic that we're using, that the feed shrink is very low and our flexibility is very high because of this. That's our commodity shed. So we'll have two mixers. And a third one moving around, and one gentleman in the payloader, highly skilled. Um, rule number one is don't put in a highly, an unskilled person in a payloader. <laughs> the damage will be amazing. Uh, but he'll, he'll mix the 15 or 20 ingredients that we have in there. It's all computerized. He's got a little a screen in his payloader telling him what to put in next. And then the guys are dropping it at the pens. Uh, we are going to a little bit larger payloaders at the farm, or excuse me, mixers at the farm because we want to get cows fed a little bit faster than we're getting them fed. A lot of byproducts, wet cake, this is out of ethanol, uh, ethanol plants 15, 20 miles away, and byproducts, as so many of us know in the business, are a big part of our feed rations. And we, uh, we monitor how the, the degree of accuracy in there. If you come onto our farms, you'll find very clean and organized shops. Uh, my business partner, Todd Willer, is extremely meticulous, and he makes us all look good, but everything is organized. It is ready to do whatever we need to do. It's warm in the winter, and um, I was a little bit cheap in my early days of farming, and I should have put a heated shop in that's quality from day one. It would have all gone a lot better. Uh, we really, uh, he really, it, we're geared to handle just about anything that comes at us. Every sh shop has a scale by it, and every shop has a little scale house. Well, that's the end of the virtual tour, but I'd be happy to answer any questions anybody has. Thanks. Uh, you know, I don't know. I think we're going to add uh, about 20% capacity. We've always been, the question was on the feed wagons, how big are they getting? 
we've shied away from the biggest ones they make because we're afraid of the concrete damage that would occur. And we're going to try uh, some triole larger mixers. I don't know what the exact number is. I think it's like six, same, same brand, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, question was about power generation, digester. Uh, we are probably, we're close to some deals on all three of our farms of putting in digesters. Uh, we will not own them ourselves. We think that is an area of expertise that is just about as complicated as farming. And so we're going to have a, somebody else own them for us, but we're going to license with them or partner with them. We think it's a, it's a big part of the future, um, but we're not going to do it ourselves. Do you have a question? Uh, most at Rosendale, it's about 300. It's about one cow per stall, very close. At Tidyview, it's in Amro was a different model. It's about 14% uh, uh, less, somewhere in there. We run six row barns there. Uh, what is your thinking of adding grass to uh, the alfalfa? Uh, we, you know what? We don't we don't add grass to the alfalfa mix, but we do feed a lot of grass and it's for those transition diets. And so we'll buy dry grass from local farmers or regional farmers a little further out, and we'll mix that back in. We feed a lot of straw also. But uh, you don't, as far as uh, planting, I mean, seed down a field, uh, putting, or using grass with the alfalfa, we're not the field right now. Yeah, we, we, we would like to have our ingredients, and if we want to do blending, we want to do it at the mixer. We don't want Mother Nature to do it for us. That's right or wrong, that's how we do it. What kind of rotation are you using for crops? It's alfalfa for three to four years, and then it goes uh, to corn silage, but occasionally we try to work in some wheat, so we get some summer fallow or some summer time to either put some manure down or plant alfalfa. And uh, now in where we're building in the sands, it's a big vegetable area, so there's going to be a little bit more dynamic rotation there, probably a le year less of alfalfa and a year less of corn, and then they'll rotate into vegetables. We don't vegetable farm ourselves, but we'll trade with guys that do. Half hour south. Yep, yep. Yeah, right. It's a terrific area, a lot of center pivots. Yep. yep. Uh, the, the heifers are sent to Kansas to a feedlot, uh, to a heifer grower, and the, the males are sold. We sell them to local uh, steer growers. I also noticed that you had your steers in that process. Yep. Doesn't that seem wasteful? Well, you know, it's, it's the, we're recycling the feed, so it, it works out. I, I understand what you're saying. Yep. Right, or 60, 60, or 120 more cows, or whatever the number, yeah. So that 8,400, that includes dry cows? Yes. So, uh, so we'll milk uh, 7,200 saleable milk. And we have spring and heifers that are in the number. So there'll be 7,200 saleable milk, uh, maybe 900 dry cows, and 300 spring and heifers on the farm. Uh, we sold to two different places. Um, we tried to process our own milk about a decade ago, and we got our butts kicked royally. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was awful. <laughs> and so we, uh, we sold that business. Um, our goal was to be integrated all the way, and uh, it was just not so good. Uh, it, it is an area of expertise that is every bit or maybe more difficult than dairy farming. And uh, so we've, we've been cured of that temptation, at least for a while. Yes, real close to that calving area that's all in that cross vent. Okay. Yep. Yep. We do have our hospital pen close to there, but we have it so that the cross vent air can't go across the cow that's going to calve. So if a, a cow is sick with pneumonia, you don't want that air going near her, near the maternity area. Other than Mosley, how far, how far south of Plunkett is the Rosendale farm 
Uh, Rosendale, I'm sorry, I, the one in the central Wisconsin is south of Point 40 minutes. The, uh, Rosendale is between Oshkosh and Waupon. Yeah. yeah. It, the, the one under construction is a half hour south of Stevens Point, roughly. Grand Marsh. Yeah. That's a bowling alley and a tavern and a town hall. And a marsh. Uh, we are we're putting in a rotary. Um, we're putting in a bomatic there. Um, we are. It's no testimony to the quality of De Laval. We love De Laval's parlors that we have at Rosendale, but we're uh, putting in a uh, bomatic parlor at uh, Newchester. Well, a couple things. One is that we're giving the cows a little bit more space head to head where the stalls are. Uh, Two is we are looking for ways of cutting the electricity use of that elaborate manure system. And so we're putting in a, at the moment, a Comro system that has far less moving parts, less power being used uh, to wash sand. That's our objective. It, it incorporates um, McClanahan system and incorporates augers and, con and uh, channels, but we think it might be more efficient. And that's what we're trying to do there. Oh, we're putting in a covered lagoon also at Newchester. And the covered lagoon kind of has to be worked with the manure system. Uh, very expensive, um, but if you get solids underneath it, you're going to tear your very, very expensive lagoon cover off to get your solids out, and that would be a disaster. And so that's why it's got to be designed in. Well, thank you, everyone. If anybody's got any questions afterward, I'd be happy to answer them.